second year of programming that we've put out from the AHPBA Clinical Trials Committee. Last year, we successfully completed our, our inaugural AHPBA webinar series and clinical trials. We had four quarterly seminars highlighting fundamentals of clinical trials. These were discussions led by thought leaders in the field um, with um, a course exam at the end and certification certificates that we handed out and distributed at the 2022 AHPBA meeting in Miami. This year, uh, we're excited to put out our second uh, series. This is the AHPBA clinical trials um, second year of, of webinars that we're actually um, excited in terms of uh, the upcoming year. This is really going to focus more so on the analytical synthesis of clinical trials, breaking down and critical analysis of clinical trials, and again, by a diverse group of speakers, again, thought leaders in the field. Today, we'll begin with our first seminar, and I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Galami, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you all for being here. Great, thank you so much, Akhil. Um, and, and I really wanna give our first speaker, um, Dr. Shroff, really the utmost time. So um, I'll make her introduction very quickly, which is not really justified based on really her accomplishment, really just great role model and leader she is in the field. Um, Dr. Shroff is a medical director and the clinical um, trials office as well as the chief, um, section chief in GI medical oncology at um, in Arizona. And um, she will really go back and sort of dissect the um, SWOG 1815 study, which was clinic, like clearly like the first like you know phase three with, with an incredible really way of accruing and showing that we can do such big trials on a national level. So really we are greatly honored to have her here today. And without further ado, Rashna, I'm gonna give you the floor. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for the invitation to speak to you. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and like uh, Dr. Galami said, my, my focus today is not really on, was this a, a negative trial, which it was, um, or uh, what the real results were of SWOG 1815, but to really kind of think through as I look back in retrospect, uh, what things worked and what didn't. And most importantly, I think use this as an example of how the NCTN is an absolutely doable mechanism for asking clinically meaningful questions. So, you know, I will I will start with what I think are typically the the naysayers of the the NCI funded trials. So the NCTN mechanism as for those of you who don't know, includes all of the cooperative groups across the country. So that is SWOG, which is University of Arizona. We are a SWOG institution, Southwest Oncology Group. And then there's ECOG, Akron, NRG, and Alliance. Uh, and when I first pitched the concept of doing a study that we had done in a single arm phase two and taking it to a phase three, these are just some of the, and I, I mean, these are actual quotes uh, of um, things that were told to me in terms of why we shouldn't do it. So first was it's not possible to do these trials uh, in, a, in a meaningful manner. There's just too many hurdles. There's too much red tape. Uh, second, for biliary tract cancers, you really can't do um, use the NCI mechanism to do rare tumors. Uh, it's too slow. Uh, you can't get an answer fa fast enough to be able to say, yep, this was a useful uh, study. And you also, people were telling me, and this is not related to SWOG 1815, but, you know, sexy trials, these kind of hot trials that are that our pharma partners think through when it comes to drug development, you can't really do that in the NCTN. And I've just listed here a couple uh, studies that I think chain that actually challenge that paradigm. Uh, there's also kind of a history of their of them saying that really the the ones that the NCI wants to support are these large randomized phase three trials. But you know, look at um, Matt Katz and his Alliance Borderline Resectable Trial in Pancreas Cancer. And then of course there's the question, which is of course relevant to the AHPBA as well as all, uh, all of our multidisciplinary partners, that you can't. You know, this is really the medonc space. You can't do multidisciplinary trials. And I've just listed a, a couple studies that again flip that on its head. So just to level set, you know, why SWOG 1815 was born, and I'm not going to go into the details of the trial, but there was a single arm phase two trial that was done at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Mayo, Arizona. It was 60 patients, all newly diagnosed biliary tract cancer patients, and they got this triplet regimen, GEMSYS, with the addition of NAB paclitaxel. And the study was designed to see if there was an improvement in progression-free survival. And, you know, this was the patient population that accrued. And the reason I'm showing you that is it's very reflective of what we see in the U.S., 
Um, so metastatic patients, primarily 78%, and primarily intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma patients. That's really the demographics of biliary tract cancer patients in the US, which is somewhat different than if you look at the larger global studies. So this study had an interesting signal, and that's usually how most NCI-funded or ncTN um, oriented studies are kind of born is you do a smaller study and you see, say, a, an improvement in median progression-free survival or overall survival compared to historical controls. And out of that is born a question. And so that is how 1815 really came to came into existence. And when we first started kind of shopping this concept around, there was uh, GEMSYS was the standard of care. And there was a feeling that we really needed to understand, given that it was a triplet chemotherapy, what it did in, in comparison to GEMSYS alone. And so we pitched the concept to SWOG. We then pitched the concept to the NCI Hepatobiliary Task Force and the GI Steering Committee. So, you know, it, it went through all of the stages of approval. Um, I bring up the study design primarily because there was a lot of back and forth here. There was, this was in, for newly diagnosed patients, and we knew we wanted to compare the triplet to the GEMSYS. There was discussion if we really think GAP is, GAP as I call it, the triplet, is as, as, as effective as the single arm phase two is, should we do a two to one randomization? And so that was a big question, right? Because the idea of clinical trial design is you should have equipoise. And so I actually ethically was like, I don't know if we should do that because we don't really know that the triplet is better than the, than the doublet. And is it right to put, you know, two thirds of patients on the triplet versus one third. So that was a lot of back and forth. And we went all the way up to the GI steering committee to kind of discuss those questions. That of course also affects statistical design. Um, the primary endpoint was overall survival. And I felt really strongly that it needed to be overall survival because that is truly, I mean, A, it's a hard and fast endpoint and you can't argue with it. And B, in the world of biliary tract cancers, endpoints can get kind of murky and progression-free survival doesn't always tell the whole story. Response doesn't always tell the whole story. And so really, Overall survival to me made sense. The other thing that we did in the design, because we knew this was going to be the first prospective randomized phase three trial in biliary cancers in this country. And at that time, Topaz and, and Keynote 966 had not read out, uh, was to really try to build in biospecimen collection. Um, my hope was, is regardless of how 1815 turned out, we would have archival tissue and blood banked on patients so that we could truly learn from this study regardless of what happened. Meanwhile, and as often happens, things get things get thrown in, you know, wrenches get thrown into the mix. And while this study was starting to just get ready to launch, GAP was actually added to the NCCN guidelines. So just another example of how best laid plans. I was really worried, I'll be frank. Once these got into the guidelines, I was like, great, now no one's gonna put anybody on this trial because everybody somehow was like a believer in GAP and they're gonna just start giving patients GAP because there's a randomization here off, you know, off protocol and um, get it approved because it's in the guidelines. So the study was initially designed with a target hazard ratio of 0.7. It was designed and powered, and there were stratification factors as you can see here, but it was designed and powered to include 441 patients or 400-ish patients. Um, the process of getting this approved went all the way up to the GI steering committee, and there was a lot of back and forth with Carmen and all the other leaders of the steering committee and NCIC TEP about whether or not we could do a study that was 400 plus patients in biliary tract cancer. This was a rare study. This was a rare tumor. Are patients going to go on the trial? Um, are we going to spend NCI dollars on a trial that doesn't accrue? So the first iteration of this trial, they made me amend it. And the reason I bring that up is because one of the things that I have learned in clinical trial design is that what you always think is best is not necessarily always heard. Um, and so they set a very high bar because they felt it was a triplet regimen. And so if it was truly going to be a positive study, it needed to be an impressively positive study. So the target hazard ratio was 0.63 and the N was 268 patients. So much smaller study, much higher bar. So I'll be honest, I begrudgingly opened that study. And the other question about opening a study quickly, as you can see here, this was kind of the summary. Um, the capsule was approved in 2017. Um, it was officially submitted in February of 2018 to NCIC-TEP. And I mean, I still remember I was in China on a call with Carmen Allegra and Howard Hoxter. Um, I was on vacation. Uh, and that was probably March or April. So we finally got it through um, 
NCIC TEP and all of that, we got the approval in March. And then we basically had all these kind of dropped it. These were the target dates and these are the actual dates that we did. And so I just bring this up, not because I did anything spectacular, but really just to point out that you can move things quickly through the process for opening something within the NCTN. Um, I had a lot of champions on, on the SWAG GI committee, Dr. Hawkster and Dr. Jobley and Dr. Elkwery and all these fantastic people who really helped, helped me usher this along. Um, and then you'll see that the target activation date was 12-23 of 2018. And we activated in December of 2018, actually a couple of days ahead of schedule. And then the other thing that I was determined to do, um, for those of you who know me, I don't like to be told no. And so um, I was a little bit a little bit frustrated about the 268 patients. And so what I did was, um, you know, we we got all hands on deck. We had fantastic champions across the, the cooperative groups, really strong champions for ECOG, ACRA, and Alliance, and NRG. And, and I had a study co-chair for SWOG. And as you can see, the first patient went in in February of 2019. And then basically, we just blew the target accrual, which is the dotted line, out of the water. So we accrued like gangbusters through basically one year. And in February of 2020, at exactly one year that this, you know, from the first accrual, we hit the 268 patients. Um, and so I, I went back to Carmen. I went back to Carmen Allegra and I said, look, we've accrued 268 patients in a, in a year. Um, clearly, this is an unmet need. Clearly, this is a trial that can accrue. We need to do better. Um, and so to his credit, he let us amend the protocol. And so we amended the protocol. We switched to a target hash ratio of 0.7. We expanded the total end to 441. So this huge drop here is when we shut down the protocol. I also want to point out this is COVID. So COVID hit at this time. Um, shut down the protocol, put the amendment through. And then as soon as it opened, we picked right back up. And literally within two years, we finished accruing 441 patients. And what I will say is this was, I mean, by all definition, a cooperative group study. Not surprisingly, some of the big centers were the top accruers like MD Anderson, but you'll see we had a number of different accruing sites. We had participation across each of the cooperative groups, SWOG being, you know, the lion's share, but still co contributions across the other cooperative groups top investigators from a lot of different sites and involvement from lab sites as well as smaller NCORP sites and things like that. So to me, what I really wanted was this to be a study that was accessible to all of our patients across the country. And, you know, what was really great to see is that I think by and large, we were able to do that. We had a number of planned interim analyses. We had two formal ones and both interim analyses did not show any signals for safety. Um, and so the, the study was able to kind of go all the way through. Like I mentioned, these were the statistical considerations with the final, with the final um, study. And I just bring this up to again, point out two thirds of patients were intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. And so this is a little bit different than the Topaz and Kino demographics because the US is skewed a little bit more in the favor of intrahepatics. This was the, the, the results. The overall survival was numerically improved, not statistically. 14 months versus 12.7 months. And it was a negative trial. <laughs> there was, I will, I will be honest, my study co-chair um, and I got the data from the SWOG statistician and nobody else knew for like a solid 48 hours. And um, I remember telling him, I'm like, I'm, I'm depressed. And he's like, let's sit in the suck. Let's sit in the suck for a little bit and then take a step back and figure out what we can learn from this study. Um, and so progression-free survival also not statistically significantly improved. However, when we started to kind of slice and dice the data, which, you know, we can't do by the purest statistical word terms, but all of us do as clinicians and recognize that there are clinically meaningful and relevant questions that can come from it. There was some interesting trends in terms of survival by disease site with a trend towards better survival with gallbladder cancer, 17 months versus 9.3 months. And there was a trend towards better survival in the locally advanced patient population, 19.2 months versus 13.7 months. All small numbers. So, you know, you cannot make a P value that is significant, but still interesting signals. The response rates were not as exciting as the phase two. The overall response rate was 31%. This is investigator assessed and a disease control rate of 77%. But again, Interesting signals when you look at gallbladder cancer with a response rate of 44% versus 22%, and uh, slightly even improved on the extrahepatic patient population, 34% versus 21%. So, it, you know, it made you kind of stop and say, what can we take from this? So, 
first of all, it just points to the fact that stratification factors are really important in clinical trial design. Um, there are some obvious stratification factors that we think of when we think of biliary cancers, but there's also really creative things that we can and should be thinking about nowadays, especially in the world of genomics and, and precision oncology. And I will say that it, at least for me, has me scratching my head about the gallbladder cancer patients and the locally advanced questions, locally advanced question. And so the, the obvious thing that I've been thinking through and talking through with my colleagues and my peers is, can we build on this? And what could be the next study question, which hopefully comes from every clinical trial is, this was the conclusion, what can we take from it and what can be the next study? That said, you cannot downplay the safety. GAP is a, is a tough regimen, primarily in myelosuppression, and there was no way for me to sugarcoat this when I presented it. Um, that being said, those of us who use GAP, we know how to manage it. It's just, you know, the way that this is written in the protocol, there's only certain, certain types of nuances that we allowed for. So these were my conclusions when I stood up on at the podium and, and talked through it. I said, nope, improvement in overall survival negative. Um, ORR, you know, numerically higher, but not statistically. Lots of grade three to five <laughs> hematologic toxicities, but some exploratory analyses and locally advanced and gallbladder po patient populations that we should think through. And then biomarkers that have left, that, that have a lot of work to be done. So as late as October of, this is 2022, sorry. Um, we have a lot, as you can see, of blood specimens and um, blocks that are banked in the SWOG bio repository. So we are actively thinking through what the right questions could be and the right use for these biospecimens. And, you know, I keep saying, I knew from the get-go that it was not going to be gap for all. Um, I think that there could be some utility for it. And I think that this study has helped me think through it even more. Is there a role for it in perioperative disease and downstaging patients? Um, and I think we know GEMSYS isn't going anywhere. We know GEMSYS IO is not going anywhere. Um, so the question is, is, does GAP have a role somewhere in there? And, you know, as a testament to Dr. Mithel and a number of the, the surgeons um, in, that are active in the AHPBA, some of these questions have already been asked. So I always say, to me, the big question is, is when you finish a trial, positive or negative, what is the legacy? Um, I think we have a new median overall survival for GEMSYS alone and the triplet. We have biospecimens that we can learn from. We probably do have patients who can safely tolerate the triplet therapy and could potentially be looking at gap in very specific questions uh, or in very specific spaces. Uh, but to me, I think what was the, the coolest part of this trial is that we proved to the NCI and to others that we can do a randomized phase three trial in biliary tract cancers and answer a clinically meaningful question quickly. And we really did it, not because of me or because of one person, but because of this community, which for those of you who are part of the Clangia community, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a really special community. This is the slide I put up as, as my last talk. And that was just an example as my last slide for my presentation at GIASCO. Um, and I'm just showing it now just to explain how many people actually supported and got S, um, S1815 across the finish line and how you really do need to partner and build bridges to be able to get these this work done. So my key takeaways, I you know, number one, and this is my motto in life, don't listen to the naysayers. Um, I think you can be creative and innovative in study design and stats. I will tell you sometimes the NCI mechanism, the statisticians are very purist pushing them. I think it's okay to push the envelope. I think it's okay to ask for very different statistical approaches because the antiquated way of a hazard ratio of 0.6 and, you know, OS is the hard and fast endpoint might not be the best way to really understand what our drugs can do for our patients. As I hopefully have shown you that you need to create consensus, it really supports cooperation across the group and you can leverage the task forces to do this, at least if you're using the NCI mechanism. You should build in translational work. I firmly believe every trial we do should have translational work in it so that we can learn from every single trial. And I really think the negative trials don't diminish impact. And I'm not saying that to lick my wounds. Uh, I'm saying it because I think it's really important to not let it discourage you and rather inspire and motivate you for the next idea. So with that, I thank you. Wow, what a tour de force. Um, I had no doubt that you can do it in less than 20 minutes in a, in a remarkable way. Um, I, I wanted to just be mindful of your um, time uh, and wanted to see if there's any questions in the audience. I'm sure Shishir has some questions. I wanted, I wanted to give, I do want to say something, but I do want to give opportunity for- Yes, other... I wanted to just make sure people on the call get a minute to- 
but you can maybe why don't you say something and then I can we can sure. Give up sure. Well. Again, Rechna is always phenomenal, and thank you for everything you brought to us and for participating in these webinars. In the spirit of dissecting the trial, and you and I have talked about this a little bit. You know, they they obviously pushed you for a high, like a very low hazard ratio, very aggressive hazard ratio, I should say, is the word. Two hundred some odd patients. Now, in the end, four hundred and forty one. And I always wonder how to interpret because the magnitude of difference between the two arms was the same as Topaz and as Keynote. The absolute value of overall survival was actually greatest in with the gap regimen compared to Derva and or um, Pembro. And yet those are positive trials. This is a negative trial. So what can we learn from a dissection standpoint in terms of design statistically? You know, in a Topaz had 750 patients or something. Is it just the number of patients that's making the difference? Is it the way it's being analyzed? Is it when the events are occurring? All of the above. But what can we learn there? Because yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, the short answer is is I, I really do think it's about numbers. I think it's about you know creating uh, creating. <laughs> creating stats to work with, with what your trial design is. You know, I mean, Topaz was 680 patients. Keynote was 1,085 patients. Um, the, the target hazard ratio for Topaz was 0.8, I believe. Um, and so, you know, it, it comes back to, for those of us that are in clinic, and I said this, you know, AstraZeneca heard me say this as soon as Topaz came out and, you know, 1815 hadn't even read out yet. It had nothing to do with my trial. I was like, yeah, I don't know what to say about this um, because, you know, it, is this clinically meaningful for my patients? Now, what I, you know, immunotherapy adds a complexity because there is that tail on the curve and those 25% of patients that are benefiting are truly benefiting. Um, and in the keynote data, there's a duration of response that I think is, is somewhat interesting, though they continue gemcitabine. So it's important to kind of put that into context. Um, you know, yeah, I think that this is, I guess that's what I was kind of saying without saying it, uh, in terms of trial design, I think it's important, especially in the NCI, where we do have kind of very traditional approaches, I think, to statistical design. Um, you know, like our statistician for SWOG was like, nope, we need 90% power. Well, if you look at most pharma-sponsored studies, target hazard ratio is around 0.8, and it's 80% power, um, which, you know... I, Again, it's all stats. The, to me, the question is, is what would be a clinically meaningful improvement in overall survival? What would make me want to use a drug? And so that is what I think should drive how we start to statistically design and power our studies accordingly, not to mention just the feasibility component. I knew we could do a 400 person study in biliary cancers that I wasn't worried about. Um, but I had to acknowledge that GAP is a triplet regimen. And so you want to see a, a, a meaningful improvement in overall survival if you're gonna give somebody Gem cis and that paclitaxel. And but I do think that it is a little bit of statistical maneuvering. And that's why I think when we design our studies, we should push our statisticians a little bit harder in terms of doesn't always have to be the purest hazard ratio of 0.6 or 0.7 and a power of 90% and and all of those things that that they sometimes kind of ask for. Yeah, and no, I think great points. Because again, you know, the the direct the magnitude of difference in those other two trials is no different, but they're associated with p-values that are low. And now they're quote unquote standards of care and people have um, abandoned the gap regimen in this setting. So I appreciate you saying that actually, because um there was a there's a concept that you know was just discussed at SWOG, um, you know, and Rashna, you were there at the discussion, and it's actually uh, one of my own concepts. And you know, and I, I think you know one of the really greatest comments from a really good mentor was that you shouldn't be driven just by stats trying to figure it out and don't let that mold it because you know I, I came back from that meeting saying like I'm scientifically really not like really convinced that this is going to work out just because we're going so aggressive like you said on the hazard ratio like you know I can't be expecting that this you know the change in effect size difference is just you know it was like a 19 months difference and I was like this is just not going to be possible so we're just shooting ourselves in the foot so just right. because we're trying to run a smaller trial so I think for all right. of those who are listening, like I walked away, with, like literally saying, I do not want to run this trial like this because I don't believe in it. That was not the initial, you know, sort of thought and scientific process that like even led to this idea. So I think I applaud you for going back um, to Carmen and obviously the AGI steering committee to really fight for that, you know, because it just didn't make sense. I mean, why are we doing trials just to kind of make it look like pretty, <laughs> but then not know what to really do with the answers, I think. Um, that's a great example. 
any other questions maybe from the audience feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions if not then I do know that um, Dr. Schroff needs to go. Again, thank you for being the honorary member of our surgical committee that has come here twice. Um, we are acknowledging that. We had a bunch of very positive comments after your last talk, so we re-invited you. So I really appreciate you making the time. Happy to participate. Thank you to, so much um, thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Thank you. Right. I appreciate Bye, it. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Dr. Schroff. That was excellent. Um, so really excited to welcome our second speaker, uh, Dr. Paul Kerr Nicholas. Uh, he's really a great example of a surgical PI um, that's integrally involved in the design and implementation of a large phase three uh, clinical trial. Dr. Kerr Nicholas is a surgical oncologist at ODEP Cancer Center at Sunnybrook Health Science Center in uh, Toronto, Canada. He's professor in the Department of Surgery and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation uh, at the University of Toronto. Um, he's head of the HPB concept team. It's a national collaborative dedicated to advancing the care of patients who have liver and pancreas disease through multi-center clinical trials. Um, and he's principal investigator of the HELIX trial, which he's gonna uh, speak about today. It's a phase three trial, multi-center randomized control trial evaluating TXA and perioperative blood transfusion in patients undergoing liver resection. We're honored to have Dr. Karen Nicholas here with us today uh, to discuss the HELIX trial. Thank you so much for making the time and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, great, thanks so much Akil for, uh, for inviting me and, and Seth for putting this on. Let me just get that into there. So, um, this will be quite different. I thought the last talk was phenomenal. Uh, great, you know, view under the hood of the cooperative group mechanism. Um, for those of us that don't do a ton of cooperative group trials, um, this is going to be a little bit, a little bit different. This is a um, investigator initiated trial that we ran with grant funding uh, across several institutions in Canada and one U.S. institution. Um, and I thought what I would do for this is focus more on the development uh, and practical aspects of how we got to the point of, of conducting this trial. Um, we've just finished the trial earlier this year, so I can't share the results of it yet. We're just finishing the final stages of the analysis. Uh, but I thought it might be interesting for the group just to hear about how we got here. And I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions about the design as we go. Um, as with all trials, this is obviously a, a, a body of work that I'm presenting, but was put together by many people. Here's our steering committee, including uh, surgeons, anesthesiologists, hematologists, and methodologists uh, from Canada. Uh, and these were our funders at the bottom. So really the impetus of this started uh, back in 2013 when I just had recently started on staff and was interested in doing clinical trials. Um, I wanted to take a little bit of a different approach to clinical trials. And I thought it was important uh, to try to build more of a framework to bring a group together uh, to do collaborative research. I thought HPB was really an optimal place for this since it's really largely regionalized, um, both in Canada and the US. Um, also, generally, most, most surgeons who are doing HPB are, are generally fairly academic, uh, have additional training, and are interested in this. So I wanted to start a little bit of a, a grassroots organization with a focus on doing clinical trials and develop the ideas actually uh, as part of this collaborative group, rather than starting with an idea and then trying to bring a group from that. And to me, I think this is one of the first aspects I just wanted to, to talk about in this session is really the difference between buy-in and engagement. You'll hear a lot of people uh, talk about the importance of getting buy-in once you have a trial uh, or really any initiative. And to me, Buy-in is different than engagement, and I prefer thinking about engagement early on. So here's what I think of when I think of buy-in. I, I think of a small group of senior, highly respected people getting together and deciding what they think is best, and then trying to sell it to a large group of people, the stakeholders who are actually going to be doing the work. And I, I would put to you that that's the way that most clinical trials are done. There's a small group of you know opinion leaders or people who've who gain position in an organization um, and a small group of people come up with an idea 
and then they try to sell it, right? The term buy-in implies that you're selling something. And, you know, I think from my perspective, we should be doing things the other way around. We should be asking the stakeholders, including clinicians, surgeons, uh, patients, policymakers, what the relevant questions are, what they're interested in, and then we should be taking that and doing our best to answer them. Uh, and that's engagement, that's not buy-in, that's, that's community engagement. So that was one of the, the principles that I, I wanted to try when we set out to do this uh, about actually exactly a decade ago now. Um, so what we did is we started this group called the HPV Concept Team, and it stands for something, and I don't even remember what it stands for anymore, all those letters, just a lot of letters. Uh, but we went and we, we surveyed our members, which were basically HPV surgeons and patients and advocates across Canada. And we asked them about, you know, what, what ideas they thought were relevant in HPV surgery that we should explore. We had a steering committee review them and we, we came up with the top 10 ideas that we received. We then put those out to a, in a national survey. We reviewed them again in terms of feasibility. Uh, and we came up with four potential trial ideas. We then held a national meeting and we basically decided on which trials we wanted to proceed with first. And then we put together a steering committee to actually um, write the protocols and try and get some funding and actually do them. And coming out of that was this concept that we wanted to look at bleeding and blood transfusion in liver resection. Um, and so uh, we had a couple of potential ideas for interventions that we wanted to study, but we knew that the problem that we were interested in was bleeding and blood transfusion. Uh, and so one of our one of one of the students working with me at the time, Maddie Lemke, who's now a general surgery resident, actually uh, set about doing a multi-institution review to look at uh, blood transfusion rate during liver resection at uh, about four centers in Canada and found that the overall transfusion rate was about 30%, uh, spanning a time from 20, 2008 to about uh, 2012. And, and as, as we know, it's associated with significant morbidity and mortality, and even cancer recurrence. So we continued working to kind of build this story. Uh, we went to NISQIP uh, at the time, which we had just uh, opened at our institution, and Dr. Julie Halle, now one of my partners, who was our fellow at the time, did a study using NISQIP data, um, <clears throat> including 12,000 patients having liver resection, uh, and again, found an overall blood transfusion rate of 25% uh, in that contemporary era. And when we looked at the impact of blood transfusion on outcomes after liver resection, uh, after adjusting for all other covariates we could find, we found a real sub substantial impact of, of blood transfusion on morbidity, on mortality, on post-op infections, and a variety of other um, post-operative adverse events. Um, we then looked at our institution alone uh, in patients having liver resection for colorectal liver metastases over about a decade. Uh, and again, adjusting for all other covariates found a significant um, uh, difference in terms of overall survival uh, and disease-free survival uh, in patients based on simple receipt of blood transfusion. So, you know, at, at large differences here as well, about a 15% difference in overall survival and about a 10% difference when you exclude the perioperative uh, deaths, which would be larger than really, well, for colorectal liver metastases, we don't have any adjuvant, any effective adjuvant therapy, but even like for most disease processes, this would be a greater difference than one would anticipate with really any adjuvant therapy. So this, we thought, put, put the, put the um, importance behind bleeding and specifically blood transfusion in this patient population. When we were thinking of different interventions that we might use to study this, uh, one of my mentors in Toronto, uh, Dr. Sharif Hanna, um, proposed this idea of using tranexamic acid, which at the time was, had, had just come out in trauma, really. The trauma literature in 2011, the CRASH-2 trial had just been published uh, showing a benefit of TXA uh, to reduce mortality in patients having uh, multi-system trauma. And so we were interested in that and decided to, to look into it further. It had the benefit of being Health Canada approved, albeit for a very different indication. It was Health Canada approved for 
dental extraction in patients with hemophilia, not for liver resection, but it was readily available and already widely in use. There was already a, a large systematic review that had been performed, including 130 randomized trials and uh, over 10,000 patients that showed a substantial decrease in the risk of blood transfusion, uh, substantial risk decrease in the risk of death, and no difference in complications. So fairly compelling rationale. The majority of trials, though, were really in a completely different area that were of questionable applicability to liver resection. So most of them were in cardiac or orthopedic surgery. There was a few trials in liver transplant and only one very small trial in liver resection. So to see if this was really relevant uh, and if there was equipoise, we went ahead and we surveyed liver surgeons in Canada. Uh, Jessica Trong, one of our students at the time, led this work. Um, and uh, you know, looking at a variety of blood conservation strategies in patients having liver resection, we found that TXA was very rarely used. The majority of surgeons reported never using it, uh, some of them occasionally, and no one always used it. So despite this fairly strong evidence, it was not at all in, in frequent use in Canada and across the US. And so that was the rationale that we basically had to move forward with the trial. We were able to obtain a, a small amount of funding to conduct a, uh, a pharmacokinetic trial just at our institution uh, in a phase two trial. So this we did first um, over the course of about a year. We included 18 patients having liver resection uh, and we randomized them to either have no TXA, to have a, a low dose of TXA that was based on the CRASH-2 trial or to have a higher dose of TXA uh, that was based on the typical dose used in cardiac surgery. We looked at a variety of outcomes, but our, the main thing we were interested in was the pharmacokinetics. So we measured uh, the, the um, blood levels of TXA at various time points after um, the, the bolus was given. The dose that we were hoping for or the concentration we were hoping for to achieve uh, efficacy, at least in vitro, is this dashed orange line. It was 10 micrograms per milliliter. And what we saw here was that both of the doses were well above this therapeutic range, really from the time of the initial bolus right through to about uh, eight hours postoperatively, where we thought we would have good hemostasis. So based on this, we decided to move ahead with this lower dose, the, the CRASH-2 dose of TXA, and we designed this phase three trial called Helix. Uh, so it's a fairly simple design that we used. It was meant to be a very pragmatic trial. Um, the sample size is 1,400 uh, patients, allowing uh, uh, about 10% um, of patients not to have liver resection and therefore be excluded after uh, the fact. Um, patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to receive placebo uh, versus TXA. Our primary outcome was receipt of blood transfusion over the first seven days postoperatively. And we had a variety of secondary outcomes, including intraoperative blood loss, uh, and total blood loss over the hospital stay, um, symptomatic VTEs and other complications, we also are following patients for five years, looking at overall survival and disease-free survival, given the potential impact of bleeding and blood transfusion on disease recurrence. Our eligibility criteria were uh, intentionally very broad. Uh, so we included um, all patients really having open or laparoscopic liver surgery of any extent. Uh, they had to be adults. And then we had exclusion criteria really based on contraindications to TXA. So we excluded patients who had severe anemia where we thought the likelihood of needing a blood transfusion was very high. Uh, if they had existing blood clots, they were excluded. And then there were just a, a few other specific exclusions based on the product monographs, um, but fairly broad criteria overall. And the intervention was very simple, as I mentioned. It was just TXA given uh, via a bolus of one gram and then one gram over eight hours. We compared it to placebo over eight hours with everybody in the trial being blinded. Um, anything else was really allowed in the trial. So uh, we decided not to standardize things like liver resection technique. Um, we, we had a protocol that we suggested um, centers followed 
for blood transfusion, where it was a fairly restrictive transfusion protocol in keeping with best practices, but we didn't mandate it. Um, we did follow it though, and we had we we collected data on indications for transfusion as we went. <clears throat> so, in terms of the the practical aspects of how we actually operationalized this, um, this was the overall timeline. So, we activated the first trial in 2014, and we were able to do that with a uh, a C, what's called a CIHR pilot grant. So. The IHR is, our, is the Canadian equivalent of NIH, so we applied to, to them with our small phase two trial, uh, showing that we were able to do this at one site and all the rationale that we had built. So all those, the reason I showed you those studies was sort of building the rationale that, that we thought um, made a fairly compelling case that we needed this study. So to summarize, we had a, we had retrospective data suggesting efficacy. We had a meta-analysis suggesting efficacy we had population-based data uh, demonstrating the, the scope of the problem and the magnitude of the impact on patient important outcomes. And we had survey data uh, from across Canada showing equipoise uh, for the question. So that was sort of the burden of, of things that we put forth. Um, and the approach that we've used for this and for other trials is first to apply uh, for, for funding to do a pilot trial to show feasibility. Um, we tend to do what's called a vanguard trial where we do the pilot trial, but, but if um, we show feasibility and nothing changes or very, there's very minimal changes in the protocol, we move right into the definitive trial and we include the patients in the pilot feasibility trial in the definitive trial as well. So it kind of flows in nicely, but rather than going um, to ask for funding to do a 1400 patient trial, without showing that we have the ability to do it, it's a much much easier ask to ask for funding to do a 100 patient trial. So we did that. We asked for funding for 100 patients across five sites, uh, and we were successful in receiving that in 2013. And we activated the first site in 2014. Um, and we uh, then uh, achieved accrual of 100 patients within uh, just under a year at five sites. And while we did that, we applied for another smallish grant, basically to allow us to continue the trial going while we went back to CIHR to apply for definitive funding. So we did that. We applied to CIHR again in 2015. We, were, we had two grants to CIHR where we weren't successful for our full amount of funding, but they gave us uh, what's called a bridge grant where they said you scored well uh, in the grant competition, not quite high enough to get the full funding that you're asking for, but we'll give you, you know, a modest amount of money to continue building the work. And so we were successful with two of those uh, over uh, about a six month period. So using this combination of sort of small funding, we were able to get up to just over 300 patients um, at five sites. And then at that point, we were able to break through and get a large grant that basically covered the remaining uh, 1,100 patients. And so once we received that, we were able to expand up uh, to about 10 sites and our accrual picked up. Um, we slowed down a little bit due to COVID during the time frame, uh, and then basically achieved our full recruitment um, at near the end of 2022 with 1,384 participants uh, included. And we're just finishing, we, we waited our 90 days, which is our primary outcomes. Um, and we're just finishing the data analysis now, as I mentioned. So this is what our overall accrual look like. As you can see, uh, it's a long process here. Um, it basically from November, 2014 until August, 2022. Again, starting slow uh, as we sort of built up more and more funding, and then ultimately breaking through, getting more funding and being able to ramp up a little bit. We had a little bit of a dip due to COVID, but not too bad actually, and we were able to ramp back up uh, uh, shortly thereafter. So these are our final numbers. Um, as I mentioned, one of, um, I guess, a, a learning, learning process from earlier trials and, and from this was to keep the eligibility, the eligibility criteria quite broad where we were able to. So we screened nearly 4,000 patients, and you can see about two-thirds of patients were eligible. So that speaks to really the broad eligibility criteria that we, that we intentionally used. 
And of the eligible participants, about half of them um, consents to participate uh, in the trial. So yeah, 72% of screen patients eligible and 50% of eligible patients consented uh, throughout the trial. This was randomization across our sites. Uh, you can see fairly good um, participation across all sites. Um, this was our site, so we did lead uh, enrollment, which I think is an important message as well. I think if you are doing trials like this, it is important to kind of lead by example and show that you can do it at your site. And then we did have you know, friendly competition across the sites and things like that, which helps with accrual. So here are sort of my take home points um, that I learned during the process of, of doing this. Um, if you're doing these types of trials, I would suggest starting small and building. I think it would have been a challenge to apply for you know, $3 million or whatever right at the beginning to do a, a trial in 1,400 patients when we haven't shown that we can enroll patients. So I like this strategy of starting small, getting some pilot uh, grants and getting patients into the trial. Once you have you know, patients enrolling in a trial and you, you go back uh, for more funding, it, it becomes very hard for the funding agencies to say no when you've already enrolled 300 patients you know, and you've shown that you can clearly do it and they've given you funding before. They've sort of philosophically, they have agreed that, they, that the concept that you're proposing is important. Um, and then once you show that you can do it, I think it's hard for the funding agencies not to support you. So starting small and building is a sort of a model that we've used in other trials since then. I think doing your homework and building the case uh, to do the trial from you know, single institution studies, population-based studies, meta-analyses, surveys. I think that, that putting all of that together is an important piece of applying for grants um, if that's the route that you're going. The nice thing is, all of that is publishable work as well. It's hard to make an academic career just publishing randomized trials. And so, you know, doing that background work and publishing it um, is important uh, to support the work and to support your academic mission. And also is a nice opportunity to involve your trainees because uh, it's hard to involve trainees a lot in the larger randomized trials. <laughs> I think um, engagement is super important in doing randomized trials. You know, they are collaborative and I, and again, I would distinguish between engagement and buy-in. I think getting feedback early on and listening when concerns are raised and not kind of plowing ahead with what you think is best is really important. I think if you don't have engagement and if, if the group that is going to be enrolling to the trial and if patients don't think what you're doing is important and that the protocol is, is good, then they won't enroll in the, in the trial. So I think it's important to listen and actively engage all stakeholders early. Um, number five uh, is a tricky one, and I think we didn't do it great in this trial. So this is one big learning piece for me is, you know, when you're doing trials, it's often temptation, tempting when you're building your case report forms to want to collect every single piece of data that you can imagine. You're, you're thinking, oh, I've got all these patients in. I may want to look at this after. I may want to look at that. And the temptation is to build huge CRFs um, I think our CRFs in this trial were a little bit too big. We tried to keep them simple, but even still, we ended up collecting a mountain of data, which, you know, it'll be good. We will have secondary analyses that can come out of this, but there's a lot of data now looking at it that, that we'll never really use um, and that was just probably inefficient to collect. And in particular, um, I would avoid ever having an other category that's one of the delays that we're just having to manage right now is when is, you know, for example, uh, diagnosis, you know, we had a bunch of standard categories and then we have an other category. And what we found is other gets used and abused by the sites, again, with best of intentions. Uh, but, you know, if you have a patient that maybe fits into another category, but you're not totally sure the, the research staff tends to use the other and then use text to type in what, what they thought the patient had or whatever. And it becomes very difficult to analyze and a lot more work after the trial. So um, I would try not to have other categories for CRS like at all, force people to put data into categories. It's a lot um, easier to analyze. And then the final thing is just lead by example. Again, I think if you are gonna run a trial, you need to be very engaged in it. I think it's important that your site uh, should be leading uh, enrollment and you as a PI 
to probably be the leading uh, investigator if, or leading enroller uh, if you can. If you do that and other people see that, it really um, will, uh, I think, encourage them to enroll as well. Whereas if you're not enrolling in your own trial, I think it's hard to encourage others to do so. So those are all the points. I'm happy to take any uh, questions and I'd love to hear um, feedback from other people who've done trials as well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Karen Nicholas. That was, that was really great. I think it's just outstanding that um, you were able to complete uh, a trial that size um, with uh, uh, such a complex disease. Can you just expand a little bit uh, about, you talked a lot about funding, which was really great to see that timeline of how you were able to build upon your kind of phase two and expand it to the phase three. Were there things that you guys did to make um, your trial design more lean in terms of funding? I mean, just for that amount of patients, I can imagine the amount of cost in terms of the drug, the placebo, and everything else that goes into the data regulation and regulatory. Were there things you guys did in trial design to make things more cost effective? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we tried our best to keep it as simple as we possibly could. Um, Fortunately, the drug is super cheap, like the drug costs 30 bucks. Uh, so that was helpful. Um, but we did do a lot of negotiating at our site for the phase two trial with our pharmacy uh, and, and others. And then we took the budgets that we negotiated and we shared them with other sites who were then able to use them and negotiate with their pharmacies. So we, we kind of started again, I think it starts from the beginning, starts with laying the groundwork at your place and figuring out how you can do it at your place. And if you do it well, then you can expand it to other places. We also had fairly junior RAs working on, on these trials. We did not go through the cancer mechanism at each of the sites. So, you know, we didn't use our cancer center uh, research assistants. We hired our own research assistants, frankly, because we couldn't afford the research assistance that the cancer centers are using because they're using they're you know generally they're having very senior ras or research nurses because you know for a phase one or phase two cancer drug you need that when you're assessing aes and you're having sick patients coming in for this where it's you know a, an innocuous drug that's in common use you know some places just had co-op students uh acting as ras um so the, I think that was the biggest thing was that at the site level, sites were really running this a, a bit on a shoestring, at least as we got started and broke through to the bigger funding. And then we were able to reward them to a certain extent when we got some bigger funding back in place. Um, and we were able to sort of pay them back for helping us early on enrolling. That's excellent, thank you. Any other questions from the group? I'm going to go if no one else has anything to say. <laughs> so while people are, Dr. Snyder, while you're thinking of something to ask, Paul, um, not just because I'm, I'm looking at your, you're one of the few people with a picture actually on your on your portfolio here, so I'm looking at it. But Paul, first, first, um, commend and congratulate you and applaud you for just an incredible body of work and the way you've approached that. Just absolutely phenomenal. And I really, really appreciate your commentary and distinction on buy-in versus engagement and the way you kind of built the team from the ground up and everyone was engaged uh, from the beginning and the, the painstaking and thoughtful way with which you developed the prelim data and set the stage, you know, stage by stage and kind of incrementally building up to a 1400 patient trial, really, really commendable. And, and I would just, you know, hopefully everyone appreciates the 10, 15 year commitment uh, that's been this trial. I mean, it, not even from a, just accrual, but all the years that went into getting it to open. I mean, we're looking, you're at, you're at 10 years right now easily. Um, so really, really just phenomenal. Just a couple of nuanced questions for you. You know, you had the, you had the dose from the CRASH-2 study, and then you did a pharmacokinetic study where you used the CRASH-2 uh, dose, but then you tested a higher dose, it seemed like, right? Um, when normally when you would, you have a dose that's already available in literature, you would test a lower dose and then you ended up doing that. So do you think, would you have done that differently? Do you think you wasted time on that pharmacokinetic study? Could you have just used the crash data and just started with that dose? Second question, which I may have missed, I really, really appreciate the pragmatic nature with which you approach this, you know, you're, you're disease agnostic, right? So you have a lot of, a lot of heterogeneity in there, which I'm sure you collected and you'll, you know, you'll do all these subset analyses and all that, but, um, 
I'm assuming pre-op hemoglobin was a stratification factor. Um, I, I may have missed that, so I apologize if I missed that, but I'm assuming that is. And then given your endpoint, your primary endpoints, blood transfusion, so you have a quick 30-day report, but your long-term follow-up that you're talking about 2027, I'm assuming that's a survival, but that will be done based on disease. Is that what you're planning, a disease uh, disease histology-specific uh, long-term analysis? So yeah, again, yeah, exactly. fantastic, just fan-fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Shisher, for that. That's really nice of you um, and great question. So yeah, the long-term survival will be uh, cancer-specific. It'll really be just in the large subgroup. So it'll be colorectal liver, METs, uh, HCC. I don't even know if we'll have enough cholangios or not to make it worthwhile. Probably about half of our patients are colorectal liver, METs. So it'll largely end up, I think, being an analysis in patients with colorectal liver, METs. Um, the... Oh, and then the, the, the comment about the um, dosing study, and it kind of goes along with what you were saying about building the body of literature and what have you. You know, I presented it here as a linear, thoughtful process. It wasn't really like that, right? Like, as you know, like I didn't really set out in whatever 2012 uh, or 2013 thinking I'm going to do you know, a single institution study of impact of bleeding. I'm going to do a NISQIP study. I'm going to do this. And then ultimately I'm going to do a randomized trial. It kind of happened more just, you know, I was doing work that I was interested in as, as all of us do, right? Like I was interested in bleeding and I was interested in, I had trainees wanting to do research projects, looking for easy things to do. And so we were doing that and while we were doing it, I was, you know, building this collaborative group and thinking about that on the side. Um, and then even the phase two trial, we were, we did that because we had, you know, there were small grants that would allow us to do that is the reality. Like while we were doing that, we'd already put in our grant for the pilot phase three trial. So I didn't really think it wasn't a pure scientific thing. I think you're absolutely right. From a scientific perspective, I don't think we really needed the phase two trial at all. Like the, the reality of it is it's partly opportunistic or largely opportunistic, right? So I put in the grant to do the multi-center feasibility trial that I wanted to do. And while I did that, you know, there was a local grant available for 20K or 30K. And I said, what can I do with this? How can I study TXA? How many patients can I study? Well, maybe I can study... 25 patients, is there a question I can ask? And I knew that, you know, although, although CRASH-2 seemed like a good dose, our cardiac surgeons and most cardiac surgeons were using this whopping high dose. And so it was really a question of like, do we need to do that? And it seemed an opportunistic question to ask. So I think it's a great point, is, you know, and that's, I think, the way things normally happen. Like, you don't have to have everything set out for the entire 10 years, it usually doesn't happen that way. I would be opportunistic and you don't, it, it comes a little bit to what from the last talk as well. Like you may not be able to do exactly the trial that you're interested in. You kind of have to look and see what's available for you. How much funding do you have? What patients do you have? Still do a trial that you think is interesting and going to be informative, but basically just, I think once you start doing some work in an area, that sort of a little bit of success brings on a whole lot more success. That's that. So that was more the, philosophy and what I found. Okay, we have uh, one question in the chat box. Let's see here. Question is uh, from Anthony Scholler. Can you comment on how you created your survey for MD engagement? And can you share any lessons learned? Yeah, so the survey, um... I surveyed before any trial, like before I put a grant in for any trial, I think a survey is critical. They can be hard to publish. Like I try to publish them, but surveys are harder and harder to, to publish. But I think it's critical for a grant. And as a grant reviewer, I do a lot of grant reviewing now. Uh, like I, I, it's, it's very hard to fund a trial that doesn't have a survey. Um, and I think there are, whoops, what did I do there? Sorry about that. I think there's a few things that you want to ask on the survey or you want to demonstrate in a grant. The first is equipoise. Uh, so you want to show that the question you're asking is important to the stake, to stakeholders, right? And you can do that through a survey. You can also do it through letters of support. You can do it through large organizations, you know, patient advocacy groups. 
But if you have a survey data showing that there's actual equipoise and interest in the question you're asking, that's huge. The second is feasibility. So I think we always ask in the survey, like, would you participate in this trial? And you want to obviously show overwhelming support so that you can show that the trial is feasible. And then the third point in the survey is to clarify some of the aspects that you're going to put into the protocol, um, because you can't always have the big you know, stakeholder meeting um, with filling the room and getting all that input. But I, I legitimately am interested in that input. Uh, so you know, asking questions with this, for, with, with this, with Helix, it would be like, what dose of TXA would you currently use? You know, what are your indications for blood transfusion right now? Like kind of get at a little bit of the elements that you're going to build into the protocol itself. So I, I would strongly advocate for a survey before launching into a trial or before even submitting a grant for it, um, trying to publish it if you can, you know, going to the and trying to, you know, in terms of who you survey, um, I think you want to survey the stakeholders who are going to use the information that you generate and the uh, investigators who are going to participate in the trial uh, and and or, you know, hopefully they're the same people, but they don't they're not necessarily. So um, that would be who I would target. Ours was small in this situation. It was a fairly Canadian trial. You know, I think using HPBA, if you're going to do an HPB trial through the HPB community, would be great to disseminate a survey that way. Um, and uh, yeah, I would build it, build it to answer those questions. And then also, you know, we tr I've, I, I try to build in some other questions that I think will just make it easier to publish, that will make it, you know, interesting to, to a journal uh, so that we can hopefully publish it. But that would be, those would be my tips for building the survey. That's great. Um, any additional questions from the, from the group? All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Karen Nicholas. This was really great. Um, I think we really learned a lot from, uh, you know, a trial that actually, um, is an IIT run by a surgeon, large phase three trial, learn a lot about the statistical design as well as funding. So thank you for all that, really appreciate it. Great, thanks Akil for the invite. Great, well, I mean, I knew you were a great clinical trialist, but I had no idea that it was like over a decade, like Shashar said. I think I'm just like, at some point I was just looking at the timeline. So um, it goes to show, it goes to show that all of us who are into trials really do it for a passion of love um, and probably some cruelty that we love to be tortured. Um, but without further ado, um, I will give it um, away to our last but not least speaker, Dr. Adam Yop. Um, I don't think Dr. Yop needs really an introduction to this specific um, um, group here. Um, he was very involved, obviously, in the HPBA, is today, and also um, in specifically in the clinical trial committee. Um, he was involved also with the NISCOS and antibiotics trial, as everybody knows, but I really wanted him to speak about actually a phase three trial that he did with industry. I thought that would really cover a different aspect of clinical trial design and um, experience. And um, also, I think it's just impressive to have someone be at the level to run clinical trials like this of this gratitude and also be our level funded. So as a chief um, and division of surgical oncology at UT Southwestern, um, I don't think we'll need any further introduction. Adam, please take the um, stage away. All right, Seth, thank you so much. Hopefully you guys can see my slides, right? Yeah. You see them? Okay, great. So it's a, it's a little bit of uh, changing gears um, and kind of, um, to, to let you know kind of how we got involved or I got involved with uh, a trial that was just kind of recently um, came out. Um, I noticed that Luke is on the call, so he can probably talk about it more than I can actually. Um, but it, full disclosure, really, I have zero idea what we're doing with clinical trials, um, even though I've been kind of doing this for a little bit. And it's really is, is, is I'm gonna to try to kind of go through how these large phase three trials, especially run by uh, some of the third party pharma groups are a little bit different and really how the hell I got involved as a surgeon because um, it's kind of the circuitous route. Um, a little bit of it, it was, is, is that I had a little bit of content, content expertise, especially in HCC, uh, which in the United States is probably like an end of like one or two people that actually, are interested in HCC um, other than the transplant surgeons. And so 
we had a, an institutional experience where I was a PI on a couple of trials um, that we actually ran through Merck and then Bayer um, in, a, in a single institution format. And then I was a site PI of the advanced setting, the IM Brave 150. And, and our site, um, as we see a large volume of HCC, is, was one of the larger accruing sites in the United States. Again, which is not saying much given how, how little it accrues in the United States. And I'll talk a little bit about more with that. And then I, I began some of the discussions uh, with Genentech and Roche regarding kind of as soon as I and Brave came, 150 came back positive about really needing an adjuvant trial um, in the HCC space. Um, and I think the key thing that it was either lucky um, or, or fortuitous more than anything is a lot of folks that I've talked to when they start dealing with pharma, the first person or contact they have is, is with their medical science liaison, um, who really is of no use to talk to um, with designing clinical trials. You, you have to go really to a little bit of a higher level. Um, you know, as, as you know, we called it as a kid, you have to go to the shot caller. Um, and so the shot callers are, are, are typically the folks that are the sit in the in the C-suite within the individual pharmaceutical companies in charge of big portfolios. And so I was lucky enough to kind of talk to one of them, um, somebody named Steve Hack, which in Entech. And I was invited to be on the steering committee for the I Am Brave 050 trial, um, really as the only surgeon. Um, there was an additional kind of I guess pseudo surgeon in Singapore who was mostly an interventional radiologist who was also involved and there were, there were only two of us actually within the United States who were invited. Um, and so this was kind of an interesting thing for me where we I was invited in early 2019. And it's really is, is what do we do within the steering committee and it really how much influence do we have. Um, and I, I will say I am in a complete naysayer to the cooperative group trials. Patricia sure is smiling and laughing over this, but um, the process is so much faster um, in pharmaceutical trials. The resources at the point where you get involved are already earmarked. Uh, the trial, for the most part, is done um, or not done, but the, the logistics are done. Um, and really the steering committee, what they do is, is they, they massage the trial. They look for things that are gonna be contentious, um, but they're not actually writing the trial. So it's not like in the IITs that I wrote, yeah. I was sitting here on Saturday and Sunday um, in my office writing the trials. It was essentially just communicating with the steering committee through calls. Um, and I, I think this was helpful because there's really very little ego or politics after talking to some of the folks that have done cooperative group trials. Um, you know, it's essentially just dealing with the steering committee, talking, figuring out what are the things that are going to accrue, get patients accrued the quickest. Um, we first met in early 2019. Uh, protocol was approved uh, by, I think it was late May, early June 2019 as well. First patient in uh, was actually New Year's Eve 2019, and the last patient in uh, was just before Thanksgiving two years later. So you have to remember, and this was also with, and I remember having steering committee meetings during this time, and everybody was pretty upset that it was accruing so, taking so long to accrue the 668 patients, uh, but this was right in the middle of COVID. Um, and then our clinical cutoff date was, um, uh, later in the year, just right before Halloween. So essentially from the time we came, the trial was, um, went through the protocol, wrote the protocol um, to the time the last patient was in was less than just over two years. So that is the difference I think um, with pharma and, and doing the trials through there and also doing the trials um, through some of the cooperative groups and even the IITs that, that we did. So the study design is here. Now this is all um, you know, on the NCT and this all of this stuff has been presented in one format or another at the AACR and now ASCO. And there were some contentious things that we had to kind of work through. Uh, we knew that in a adjuvant setting HCC trial, uh, we knew that 
the reality is, is a large part of the accruing centers were going to be within Asia. So we really had to take that into account. Uh, myself and Ahmed Katseb were the only two you know, people from the United States on the steering committee. Um, so a lot of the stuff we had to really take into account with the with the Chinese group, um, as they were the largest going to the largest block that was going to accrue patients. Um, and there were some things that should jump out at you right away. Is this really we included resection and ablation? We really debated should we include resection and ablation? Um, or just resection alone? And how did you make sure that you actually did a proper ablation? And so uh, what we mandated is, is that folks after the ablation, they actually had imaging demonstrating no evidence of disease by modified resist. Um, the second thing kind of that really should jump out is, is we allowed one optional cycle of taste. So that you know, initially when the data was presented, it, it kind of raised some eyebrows, but we have to remember is, is that uh, taste in a post-operative setting, so it's just kind of a taste to the entire liver, is 100% standard of care within most centers within China. Um, and we left this up to the investigator whether they, they did this or not. The second or the next thing was, is to allow the optional crossover upon recurrence. So there were two groups, the Atizo and BAP group, and this was all based on the IM Brave 150 data, and then the active surveillance group. So essentially just watching them after resection. So the folks that actually recurred either in either group were allowed to get um, additional treatments. And that whether that is further surgery, whether that is local regional therapy, even transplantation. So we knew right a priori, right from the jump, that likely there was going to be no difference or a very, it was going to be hard to find a difference in overall survival. Um, and that, you know, reading through the, the Twitter Roddy, so to speak, um, you know, the oncologist saying, well, you know, when the results came out, it was just recurrence-free survival. Um, but there was really not a great difference in overall survival that this really wasn't going to make a difference. We knew that up front. Um, and then the, another point was the primary endpoint using recurrence free survival. And so that to us was probably a little less contentious. That is the actual AASLD um, recommend, recommendation in an adjuvant setting um, for um, you know, in, in HCC, in the HCC space. Um, so these are kind of some of the contentious ones. And then the other ones were, the, what is the definition of high risk of recurrence? And I'll kind of go through that in the next slide. And then really kind of some of the things that kind of were surprising that we actually put in were inclusion of vascular invasion. So after resection, and then the big decision was, do you put in all vascular invasion? Because in the United States, as we resect, we don't resect a lot of folks that have upfront vascular invasion, the BP1, BP2. We have to remember in Asia, a lot of the centers are resecting BP3 and BP4 with either main portal vein um, or uh, right or left portal vein invasion. And then really the length of treatment was another thing. Um, so we agreed on the 12 months uh, of treatment in the adjuvant setting. Uh, the variceal screening as the I am Brave 150 trial came up, uh, we did require uh, variceal screening um, due to the inclusion of BEV. On retrospect, I think we all agree that that probably was overstated, but at the, with the data we had, we had to really include that. Uh, so those were the contentious items. And then we went through what is the definition of high uh, of early recurrence or high risk. The thing you, you, you see or kind of really jumps out to you is we did include alpha fetoprotein as one of our um, kind of criteria for high risk. And the reason why a little bit was, is again, in the Asian groups, um, a lot of those folks don't actually secrete alpha beta protein in our center alone 60 percent of our patients actually don't don't uh, secrete alpha beta protein so it, again it, it became a little bit after the fact people were questioning it but it, it was very obvious at the time uh, why we didn't include it and 
we did include the, the other high risk features like large tumors, multiplicity, and also vascular invasion. Um, and then our statistical testing was kind of really uh, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, with the primary endpoint, we set the target ratio, uh, hazard ratio of 0.73. Um, and then with an interim analysis. So the first interim analysis um, happened with these number of events. And we knew at that interim analysis that likely we were not going to have, if it was, if we had to stop, it was not going to have enough events for overall survival. And it turned out we didn't because we actually stopped the trial at the first interim analysis because we had enum, uh, enough events. Uh, and so that gave the positive trial, but we knew right away that there was no way in hell we were gonna have enough events for overall survival. And again, it didn't, there were only 47 events. So the difference at the same time, now there are five trials right now in the adjuvant setting and they all have very different inclusion criteria. Um, from Emerald to Keynote, um, as well as the Checkmate trial. I think ours is probably the most pragmatic um, in, in what we're seeing in, 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 in our practices uh, with the tumor size multiplicity macrovascular invasion. Um, and that was to get enough, uh, to get enough events. Because what, what we didn't want to do is not have high risk criteria at all because then we weren't gonna have enough events and there was not gonna be any difference. Um, so I think that was important. I can share a little bit of the data, um, just the demographics, I think more than anything, because this has been already presented in the AACR. So we are very worried about a lot of the things like how many patients were gonna get ablated and that, and it turns out very few actually got ablated, only 12%. Um, the second thing on retrospect, um, what, what I wish probably we're a little more involved with is, and what's always going to be a criticism of any HCC trial is, well, this is just an Asia Pacific phenomenon. Um, and honestly, I'm going to throw it back out to the HPBA and some of the surgeons and, and people that do with this in the United States. It's on you not to accrue patients. The, the reason why the rest of the world only had a minor of patients is it wasn't accrued in North America. I'll tell you right now, and it's irritating um, because um, MD Anderson accrued a big zero patients to this trial, even though they had the site open and you know, I'm gonna throw a little shade at it. Um, one of the people on the study committee was from MD Anderson. They didn't accrue anybody. And so you can't whine about how these are Asian studies. The trial was open within the United States. Centers decided not to actually participate for one reason or another. Um, so the, that's unfortunately what we're left about, left with. Um, the other thing I think that was probably overstated was we were really concerned about taste. Um, very few people got taste. It was you know under under twenty people um, in one one arm and fourteen. So that, that turned out to be much ado about nothing. Um, and then the other thing that was much ado about nothing is the multiplicity. Um, so for the vast majority of these are the patients that we're actually seeing in our, in our clinics, single tumors that just had the high risk features with the macrovascular invasion or tumor uh, or poor tumor differentiation. So I think that we spent a lot of time on the steering committee talking about the inclusion criteria. Um, and it turned out that it was probably a whole lot of much ado about nothing um, to tell you the truth, which was a good, that was actually good to see. Um, this slide has been presented at AACR, so I can present this, you know, as you see the, uh, the recurrence-free survival, it is a positive trial um, by any stretch by the primary endpoint because we did stop it early. Um, so now what? So when you sit on a steering committee is, is now what do you do? What's the next step? Um, so really it's a matter of socializing the results. Um, getting them out there at multiple meetings to discuss them and through advice and ad boards um, so that it can actually become standard of care. Uh, and then the second thing is, is we collected biospecimens. That's one of the things that's not just cooperative group only um, or IIT only. So patients had biospecimens, tissue and blood. And so it's really the secondary analysis that we're interested in 
as folks who sit on the steering committee, because that's something we can really drive. And then I think more importantly, it helps us plan what the next trial is. The trial was overtly positive. And so I think this set the stage for our next trial. Um, and that's the new adjuvant um, trial uh, with the tezolizumab and um, that that should be opening um, in probably in, in early fall. And again, this has been a very quick going through um, as far as from the protocol opening to actually the first site um, will probably be in early fall. So that'll be probably about under a nine month period of time. Um, so the lessons learned, I think the speed of the trial planning completion is, is really remarkable. Um, and it's due really to the resources of, of pharmaceuticals. You know, you don't have to jump through the multiple hoops with the different politics involved um, in some of the other groups. The real concern is, is ownership. You'll say, well, what do you own? Um, you really don't own much, but you, but I, I will argue that even in, in the other large trials, you really don't own a lot either, um, unless it's an IIT. Um, and, and it's really, I think the bottom line is, is really not to be afraid to be involved with pharmaceutical trials. I think you have to be realistic. Um, there's much more money to do the trials there. Um, and you can actually help shape the trials. Um, you don't have to hustle, you know, through the NIH or the Canadian uh, grant funding mechanisms. You don't have to go through CTAP and and kind of and and, and do that. Um, so I think it's, I think there is a um, a definite role for that, especially in surgeons to be involved. So more than happy to take any questions. I know this was a little bit controversial. I've had a couple of these rock star drinks today, so. I felt the need to <laughs> contentious. That was fantastic. Um, that was really great. Um, I can maybe just start off with a question actually, because I'm personally really interested. Do you think based on your experience prior, even with industry of running an IIT versus sort of, I, I guess, and maybe correct me if I misunderstood, it seems like the company was already interested in running, you know, this concept and, you know, obviously you are well known in the field and you are seeked out versus, I don't know, being a mini person like me and trying to go and literally it is still, I would say a hustle to get industry sponsored and trying to get drugs or even bigger, like millions of dollars for trials. So do you, what do you think was a difference? And cause I mean, this seems very quick and super fast, which I agree. I think if pharma, once they're committed, they're committed, right? Because they want to see the results and they're putting in the money in. But what, what is the difference that you noticed there maybe? So going through the IHEs was interesting because it's no different than going, um, so you, you put a proposal in, um, you know, when I put the proposals in through Merck and Bayer, um, it was using their drugs. Um, it was your idea. Um, they didn't have a lot of intellectual um, ownership, so to speak. They just gave you the money, but it, it became a little bit of a prolonged process. Um, and it, it all went down to their budget, depending on the year and what their priorities are within their pipeline. Um, so the process with, I think, IATs through industry is a lot, lot longer. Um, the process definitely with these large randomized phase three trials, a lot shorter. Um, I think there is a bit, little bit of luck to it. Um, you have to remember is, is things like the original serafinib data um, was actually a phase two run by Ghassan Alba Alpha in Memorial. He was not part of the phase three. So for one reason or another, he didn't luck into the phase three. Um, and everybody knows, you know, I mean, when they talk about it, they talk about it's the Levay study, not the Alba Alpha study. So I think there's a little bit of, of luck and, and persistence. Um, and I think it's also is, is, is you have to realize is, is your, what you are interested in doesn't necessarily mean what pharma is interested in. So pharma was interested in after I am brave 150 being positive, they were interested in a TZOBEV. You have to remember it opened up billion dollar market essentially. So they were Pharma does what I call throwing spaghetti against the wall. They throw all these trials against the wall and figure out what sticks. And so they were, now they're doing it in, so Genentech's doing it in, you know, they did it in the adjuvant setting. Now it's the neoadjuvant setting. Now they're doing it in combination with SBRT. Now they're doing it in combination with local regional therapy. 
Um, so you just have to figure out, read the writing on the wall, what the next step is. To think that you're going to talk to pharma and convince them to do something they don't want, that's when that's not going to happen. Um, that's when you're better off going the IAT route, I think. Um, I think that um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a question actually from my audience, and I um, think I can sort of address this too, is do you think um, in any settings, pharma, NCT, and IIT, there will be an interest in evaluating agents in the perioperative adjuvant space before they're actually proven in the metastatic setting? Could the biology be different between the two stages and warrant different approaches, like ethical considerations? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Shisha and I kind of going through this right now. Um, with kind of in the neoadjuvant space with HCC. So, um, you know, AstraZeneca is also in this space um, and they have the Emerald 2 trial coming out. And if that is positive, um, they are willing to kind of bankroll a large neoadjuvant trial. The reality is, is if that's negative, they're not going to do that. Um, and if I am brave, you know, if the, in the advanced setting, if that was negative, they have, you know, Genentech would have had no interest in doing it in the new adjuvant. That's just reality, whether it's, you know, ethical biology. I think you have to, I, I don't be, don't confuse science with business because they're two different things. Um, you know, the reality is, is this, you think about it with serafinib, which was around since 2008 for about 10 years, about seven years, say, right? So they knew um, Bayer, Onyx, and then Bayer knew which patients responded to serafinib and they knew which patients didn't. Were they ever going to release that information? Absolutely not. Because then you cut the market by half. Um, you know, we want to know as scientists because we're interested in that. So you can't confuse science and, and actually uh, business because they're two different things. Um, I think um, that makes a lot of sense. The other comment I would have, I guess, with that is just um, because I personally am going through that actually experience, and I agree completely with you, Adam, that if there's, you know, if, if the phase three, like in an advance is negative, it's going to be very difficult to convince anybody, even yourself, probably that um, there is sort of like it's warranted to study it in different settings. That being said, I do think um, there is great interest in pharma, especially with sort of new signal seeking approaches, you could in a pilot way to look for different ways. So I think th the pendulum is shifting a little bit where, you know, there is some interest in looking at biology, right? And having some translational studies. But again, I think that's a little bit more of a hustle. Um, but I think there's are smaller studies. That's what the Morpheus platform exactly. has yeah. been doing with Genentech is, is. So what they're doing is a TESOBAB plus you know, some of the lag three, yeah. some of the Tidget um, stuff. Exactly. And so that's what they're looking to do. And these companies is they have, you know, they parasite or buy up a bunch of other smaller companies that have mm -hmm. cool drugs and then they combine it with theirs. And then they'll do a quick and dirty N of 30 to look for a signal. So then they can push it into the phase three. Yeah, um, yeah I think that makes um a lot of sense. Any other questions? Um, we are coming sort of towards the end. This was a really fantastic session. I really want to thank all of our speakers um, and the audience for participating. A couple uh, of comments, questions, uh, if you don't mind. Of oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So first of all, Adam, fantastic. Again, it's been an honor and a pleasure to be your friend for the last 15 years, and it's great to uh, Great to see you representing Sir John, particularly from North America for trials like this and the, uh, you know, on this large scale. So that's just fantastic. Um, I'll kind of intermix my comments and questions as I go. You mentioned before, you know, you have the MSLs are not the ones that really kind of get you this space, but there is obviously a hierarchy and an org chart through industry. And you kind of have, it's a little bit about street cred, right? And you had done IITs. And so you got your name out there and, you know, industry watches this and, and pays attention to who's publishing what. And so part of them is them coming to you. Part of it is you coming to them. And that was a little bit of the, you know, not lit. That was actually a lot of the impetus of starting these industry forums that we started last year at the HPBA was to really facilitate that process that you said, you know, I like the way you always say it in a different way than I do, but like, don't be afraid to get involved with industry, but that's exactly right. Like, and that was the whole point of those industry forums is to bring industry to the HPBA to facilitate an environment where we actually can meet them. They can get to know this, particularly as the adjuvant, neoadjuvant thing goes, um, you know, becomes more and more <clears throat> popular as these metastatic trials are positive. So on that note, 
can you guide us a little bit on you know navigating away through the org chart? Um, the second question is, you know, you got on the steering committee. I'd be curious, uh, you know, who, how does it decide it, or does the industry decide themselves? Like, who's the the face of the trial? Who's the primary author? Who's the one at the podium giving the talk? That I would imagine is not voted for in the steering committee. I imagine that's something that comes from the industry, but maybe you could enlighten us on that. The third thing, you know, they always talk about applicability of these, particularly HCC studies that are predominantly Asia Pacific enrolled, the applicability to the US. So, you know, you had these, these concerns about the taste and the number of tumors and multifocality, but in the end, looking at your data, it's predominantly resected solitary tumors that didn't get taste. So do you feel like the app, the applicability actually is pretty good for um, our US uh, population. Um, and the final comment, again, you and I, we're going to get this done in the new adjuvant setting, buddy. We're going to, I don't know what company's going to do, but we're going to get it done. And we're going to get it done through the HPBA somehow. And uh, um, it, the writing's on the wall. We'll see what Emerald 2 shows, but we'll get it done. So anyway, phenomenal, again, phenomenal just example of how to get involved at that level. I think it's great. So I think taking the first question is, is how do you get involved at all is, um, so everybody gets invited to invite to gets invited at one point or another to these things called an ad boards. So um, when I get invited to ad boards, I actually don't take any take any money because I, I actually enjoy the the kind of the the bantering. Um, Paul's probably laughing because I was like tortured poor Dexter at from AZ, which I nothing gives me better pleasure than to, to torture Dex. Um, but I think it's don't be afraid to get involved with the ad board. So I'll tell you, when the I Am Brave 050 data rolled out, I personally invited about 15 or 20 people um, through the HPBA to participate in the ad board down in Miami the day of day before the meeting. And I think only maybe a handful of people actually said, yeah, I think Seth was there. Um, and there was like literally a handful of people. So I'll tell you what happened out of that ad board. Um, so one of the folks that was actually at the ad board um, came, gave very kind of knowledgeable um, kind of comments. Um, it was very thoughtful he was. And now he is going to be the uh, international PI on the Atizo Bev plus local regional therapy trial um, because he was seen as somebody. So all the shot callers were in that room. Um, you know, it wasn't the MSLs, it was the higher ups, the vice presidents of Genentech, um, even though they were all wearing, you know, like jeans, they were there. Um, and so it was seen as being, this person was seen as being very knowledgeable and now he's leading the trial. So that's, if you get invited to it, there's no harm to go. It's not like you're going to be in the back pocket. I'll tell you right now, medical oncologists, you go to ASCO and you watch the disclosure slide, how many disclosures do they have? hundreds, most of them. But surgeons, I think we're, we're too good to do it. You can't cry about not being on these trials if you're asked to do it and then you don't, then you say, no, I, I don't have time or, or whatever, that's up to you. Um, but they want, these companies want you involved. I think the big thing, the applicability within the United States, absolutely 100% based on the data. Um, the, thing, the thing that we made the mistake on and Genentech made the mistake on on the trial is, is who they actually asked to be on the trial. That was re re based on the MSLs. Um, so for the neo, in the neoadjuvant space, the, the people are, it's a little bit different. You know, Gonzalo is going to be involved, Paul, up in Toronto. You know, the folks at UCLA, the high volume centers are going to be involved after talking through it more. And that's the same thing we'll do if we do a new address through AZ and the HPBA. Um, so they want to participate. They have way more money. These are billion and trillion dollar companies that want to give money to, to groups to do trials. So hey, real quick, how, how do they decide the the face, the, the primary first author? Yeah, that's, that's a little bit weird. It, it's it's something where we actually do talk about it within the steering committee. Oh, you uh, do about who is involved. So um, Pierre uh, Chow did the, did the first presentation. He busted it out at AACR. Um, it was in a weird thing. We shouldn't have done it at AACR, but unfortunately it was too late for GI ASCO. And we were worried that we we're gonna get scooped by Emerald for ASCO and Emerald hasn't read out yet. Um, so we did, we did actually, um, we do actually, you do kind of debate that within the committee. 
um, and it appeared been through through he's from Singapore. He had been through multiple iterations uh, with the I am Brave, the original advanced trial. So it was perfectly reasonable. But like, you know, other people will present the data and elsewhere. I think uh, I'm presenting at Adoka. Um, so there's all these kind of encores. Yeah. 